Welcome everybody. Thanks Misha for accepting our invitation to talk here today. Misha obtained, obtained his PhD from the Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne in 2019. And after that, he became a postdoctoral associate at New York University and a NASA Einstein Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. In July 2023, Misha will start as an assistant professor at the MIT Center for Theoretical Physics. Today, you will present Exploring Cosmological Tensions with Galaxy Survey. Misha, you can start, please, when you're ready. Thank you, Eleonora. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. It's a great pleasure. Um, I'm going to present um, some work that is done in collaboration with Oliver Filco, Giovanni Cabas, Marco Simonovic, and Matthias Zalariaga. So let me get into it. So my talk is going to be about cosmology. I guess for the audience of this seminar, I don't need to motivate the um, you know, research in cosmology and in particular, um, you know, the work in cosmological tensions. Well, over the past, the idea is that over the past uh, couple of decades, thanks to both observational and theoretical efforts, we have established a very coherent and consistent picture of our universe. Uh, let's say uh, Leonardo approximation that it all started with inflation and then evolved, you know, the inflation was a primordial accelerated expansion that uh, created the seeds for structure formation. And then later on, the seeds evolved. And at some point, uh, the, uh, you know, our universe was, um, you know, cooling down. At some point, it cooled down to the point that first atoms were created and we obtained the first image. So we saw for the first time these primordial fluctuations. And then later on, they evolved into the galaxies. And uh, so my talk is going to be mostly about galaxies. So in this sense, galaxies are similar to the CMB, but they're just more numerous. So in the sense that, you know, CMB gives you one snapshot of our universe, the galaxies basically provide you multiple snapshots. And the big success of this program has been that, um, you know, all this observational, um, most of this observational um, data, you know, most of the snapshots with fluctuations can be fit with a simple standard model on the CDM that is based on this, you know, simple assumptions, uh, inflation, they'll called dark matter and then uh, the cosmological content lamb constant lambda for to play the role of early dark and sort of, of um, late time dark energy um so this picture you know it makes sense at first um you know at first glance but even this you know very minimalistic standard model has some known unknowns so for instance we don't know what uh, was inflation exactly we don't know if dark matter um is really cold and so on and so forth so we were not even sure about you know the exact ingredients of this model what they actually mean uh, and of course, there could be something more. And um, the something more is, yeah, I would call unknown unknowns. I would say surprises from the data. So we um, has had one of these surprises for many long time, which is the Hubble tension. And then recently we had one surprise, um, which is the, um, you know, the detection of the parity evaluating four point function in the cosmological data. So all, my collaborator, Oliver Philcox worked a lot on this. So um, I um, suggest maybe to invite him at some point to give to discuss this um, in detail. I'm not going to cover the parity violation in my talk here. Um, but all these questions, you know, uh, are still there. And uh, as a community, I guess we're trying to uh, resolve them. And in my talk, I'm going to show you some results that, uh, well, some, some efforts, present some efforts, how we try to address these questions with Galaxy surveys. Uh, so most of this uh, success so far has been, um, uh, at least in terms of, you know, measurement of, you know, establishment of the Lambda CDM has been thanks to the cosmic micro background radiation. So here you see the cartoon uh, CMB fluctuations from uh, Planck. And then uh, CMB fluctuations, they represent a Gaussian random field, which we characterize in terms of its uh, two-point correlation function, the power spectrum uh, of delta T over T. Uh, and in turn, it's a it's a function of the angular scale, and here you can see the Planck power spectrum extracted from the sky. And this power spectrum is a very uh, tricky function of cosmology. Well, you can see that this power spectrum itself is a very interesting function. It has a, a plateau on large scales, it has some B oscillations on intermediate scales, and a dumping tail on small scales. Uh, so the shape is is very tricky, and it's precisely that shape that um, allows us to measure cosmological parameters here in this famous cartoon. I'm showing you how the power spectrum responds to the variation of the dark matter density. And basically, by comparing um, the actual measurements with this kind of calculations, we can you know, draw this pie chart and measure all the parameters of the standard cosmological model. Um, with Galaxy surveys, 
we want to do, ideally, we would like to do uh, the same. So galaxies are very similar to CMB uh, because they also they represent um, some over density, you know, fluctuations in, in the density field. So galaxies are characterized by this uh, function delta, which is the uh, delta rho over rho, where delta rho is the um, over density, is the fluctuation of density. Uh, and these fluctuations, they in some way are related to the primordial fluctuations that were seen during inflation. So in this sense, they are similar to CMB. Uh, the difference with respect to, the first important difference with respect to the CMB though, is that um, the, uh, the distribution of galaxies is three-dimensional intrinsically, so we can measure the uh, redshift to galaxies very precisely. Um, so we built a whole three-dimensional map of our universe, and now we can calculate the correlation of functions of this field. So this is still a Gaussian, well, it's near, it's a, it's a, it's a random field, which is nearly Gaussian. Uh, so we can characterize now it's, um, all its properties are encapsulated in the correlation functions. The simplest one is a two-point function, the power spectrum. And then we can also calculate higher order endpoint functions. And I'm going to comment on them uh, later. Uh, so here you can see the two-point function, the galaxy power spectrum, uh, of the Bose galaxy is a function of wave number. So now it depends on the full, um, let's say 3D wave number. So the higher wave number, the smaller the scales are. Uh, and you can see that this, this shape of the power spectrum is also kind of um, non-trivial. So it has a peak. It has also some B oscillations. It has some slope. And we would like to use this information to constrain uh, cosmology. This is the idea of the full shape analysis that I'm um, working on. To analyze galaxies uh, the same way as we, are, we have been analyzing the CMB. Um, just in other words, to extract the cosmological parameters directly from the shape of the uh, galaxy correlation functions. And this seems to be a good idea uh, because of multiple reasons. Uh, first of all, is that CMB and large structure structure are highly complementary. So they probe different scales, they probe different redshifts, and also they're sensitive to different physics. Well, for instance, um, Thanks to the famous Weinberg argument, the um, dark matter, so the galaxy clustering is very sensitive to dark matter fluctuations, basically it gives you direct proof of dark matter fluctuations. And this is not the case uh, for the uh, CMB where, you know, the primary CMB data is much less sensitive to dark matter fluctuations itself. Um, and another important point is that, again, large structures are three-dimensional observables. So, um, just at face value, it contains orders of magnitude more information as measured in terms of the available Fourier modes. Uh, and in principle, we would like to convert these orders of magnitude more modes into orders of magnitude better cosmological parameters. Uh, and this is the uh, kind of ultimate goal of the program that I'm uh, carrying out. So let me uh, show you a slide uh, on, on this um, exact uh, statement, the number of modes. So here on this plot, I'm showing you how the number of modes, which is a kind of a proxy for cosmological information, how this evolved over time, uh, both in large scale structures. So here I'm showing you some um, current and previous galaxy surveys, including also the ones that are ongoing or even proposed uh, as a function of, of, uh, of years, a function of time. And you see that, you know, uh, let's say in the 70s, in the 80s, there were only galaxy surveys. And basically, they were the only source of cosmological information uh, about fluctuations uh, back then. And But at some point, uh, we know that the CMB program uh, started. Um, and then the slope was uh, much steeper. So CMB started giving us much more information in galaxy surveys uh, 20 years ago. And uh, basically, now we have Planck. And uh, well, we see it over here. Um, so large scale structure surveys are only now catching up with Planck in terms of the amount of information, uh, but the, uh, well, ultimately, you know, CMB uh, measurements are limited, even the stage four, you know, this curve will at some point will end because of some fundamental limitations like the point sources, uh, but the large scale structure curve in principle can go uh, forever or like, you know, sufficiently, um, sufficiently far. So ultimately we believe that um, you know, there will be as much, at least as much cosmological information, large scale structure as it is in, in, in the CMB. So I see some, uh, oh yeah, I see some, some, some questions. Uh, yeah, what K-Max I'm assuming uh, for this. So here for this plot, I was assuming K-Max, which uh, roughly corresponds to, let's say, um, K-nonlinear or some fraction of K-nonlinear, let's say 0.2. I think that for both, 
um, I assumed k max 0.2, which is something like half of k nonlinear. So this is roughly what I used to, to make this plot. Um, all right. <clears throat> but, but of course, you know, in details, yeah, also number of moles, it, this is just kind of cartoonish picture. Uh, you know, in details, things um, are slightly more complicated. Um, another important difference of uh, Lashkin structure uh, with respect to CMB is that actually the Lashkin structure distribution is not linear. So we know CMB can be uh, well described by just linear cosmological perturbation theory, which is great. Um, but with galaxies, uh, you know, intrinsically they are kind of nonlinear. So if we take a look at the distribution of galaxies on large scales, here I'm showing you some output of a simulation, TNG, I think, then on large scales, you know, the distribution of galaxies does look like a CMB, we see some random uh, patterns of over densities and under densities. Uh, but as we start zooming in, we'll start finding some complicated structures, uh, filaments, clusters of galaxies, individual galaxies. And of course, all the structure is very complicated and uh, nonlinear. And hence also, it's non Gaussian. So obviously, you know, these kind of filaments, they represent a Gaussian structure. Um, and so there are two points here. First of all, we expect that nonlinearities are important and they're especially important as you move. To smaller scales, and the second um, point is that um, any so these nonlinearities they induce non gaussianity So any uh, analysis, um, let's say optimal analysis of large scale structure data, should include some non Gaussian information, right? Because otherwise, from this picture, it's clear that we'll be missing something. Um, so this picture, you know, the breakdown of linearity is also apparent if you take a look at the galaxy power spectrum of Boston, try to fit it with, uh, let's say, linear theory. And then you see that on large scales, you know, smaller, small wave numbers, um, the uh, linear theory kind of fits the data, it's all fine, but uh, at some point it breaks down and the curve goes off. So you need to include nonlinearities. But uh, at least here, yeah, also you kind of get an, an answer how to how to do it, at least for this range of scale. You see that the li linear theory doesn't break down uh, completely. Um, it only breaks down by like 10% or so on these scales. So there is hope that you can account for this mismatch perturbatively. And this is uh, exactly the um, method that I'm going to present today. So let me say a few words about the sources of nonlinearity that we have to worry about. So here I'm showing you another snapshot from uh, Illustrious CNG simulation. And um, the gray structure here corresponds to um, dark matter, so just pure dark matter structure, and the yellow structure, um, the, the yellow structures are basically similar with galaxies. And well, first of all, you, you see that there is some nonlinear, non Gaussian signal already for dark matter. So the dark matter distribution is, is nonlinear. This is the first source of nonlinearity you have to worry about. The second source of nonlinearity is uh, the connection between the observed luminous matter, such as galaxies and dark matter. And this is something that's called galaxy dark matter connection or galaxy bias. So you see that roughly on large scales, you know, when you have more over density of dark matter, you also have a lot of over density of galaxies. So these two things kind of uh, go together. So they match each other on large scales. But also in, in some instances, for instance, in some parts of the plot, for instance, here we see also dark matter structure, but not so much uh, luminous structure. So um, this just tells you that the two things don't go one to one. And uh, the simplest way to see that uh, is to write down something that is called perturbative bias expansion. So we write down this uh, over density of galaxies um, and on large scales. So let's say we're going to write down the most generic expression how um, this can depend on the over density of dark matter. And then on large scales, the only field that you have is the uh, field, the over density field of dark matter itself. So the relationship must be linear just from this kind of um, symmetry principles. And this is so called linear bias. But then you can also write down something like, you know, uh, delta squared times uh, different coefficient B2. Um, and then in principle, this distribution also can depend on the tidal field that is not so easy to see in this plot. So um, basically, this perturbative uh, bias model already. It gives you an idea that uh, these uh, how this relationship should look like and also it's important to stress that this relationship involves some nuisance parameters so all these coefficients b1 b2 bg2 so they are in principle unknown and you have to fit them directly from the data or from the simulation and they encapsulate the um well our uh, ignorance about the details of galaxy formation physics 
And um, there are effects that are important, such as the binary feedback and racial distortions. Those are also nonlinear effects, uh, but conceptually they are similar to the, let's say, a galaxy dark matter connection. They also involve uh, some set of nuisance parameters as well. So at least as long as we can do perturbation theory, it's clear how to um, take into account these corrections. And uh, um, but maybe okay, it's, it was not obvious uh, all the time. And I think that when the first um, precision um, measurements of the galaxy power spectrum uh, were obtained, uh, well, for instance, 20 years ago with the um, first SDSS, SDSS uh, survey re releases, it was clear that um, you know these nonlinear effects are very important and cannot be ignored. For instance, here I'm showing you like the analog of the plot that I just showed before, but from from the you know paper Tegmark 2006, and here the uh, dashed line corresponds to linear, uh, sorry, corresponds to let's say the uh, nonlinear model, and the solid line is linear theory. You can see that there is a huge mismatch between you know the data, nonlinear data, and the linear theory prediction. So this problem that the theoretical error was much greater than data error was kind of apparent even back then, 20 years ago. But then it was not clear how to systematically take into account all these um, nonlinear effects. So the standard approach until recently was to focus on observables that are approximately stable with respect to these uh, nonlinear effects. And those are the uh, distance and growth information, or in other words, the BIO and the uh, retrospective distortions of the alpha Pachinski test. Uh, and in this way of doing things, basically you would wanna, like people would discard all the shape information just because it was unreliable. There was no systematic way to explore it. So the key goal of my research was to do better and basically to use this extra shape information and try to um, extract you know more more cosmological information from it but in order to do that one one has to understand non-linearities non and um, there are conceptually two ways to do that um, which is analytics and numerics so let me say a few words about these two different ways so in terms of numerics I'm talking about simulations. So the basic one is the embodied simulation for matter clustering. So simulations seem to be a great idea, especially for the matter, matter clustering, because we know, you know, an embodied um, calculation basically is the full calculation for the system. The embodied uh, simulation gives you a result which is correct. And in principle, it works on all scales. Like you can embody simulate even very small scales. So you get the unlimited range of scales. Uh, but the problem is to describe galaxies because for galaxies we don't have the first principle exact model for galaxy formation so we always have to uh, use some kind of approximations or you know to, to calibrate uh, some uh, something from from observations in the first place so and that's why i think it's a very big problem how to simulate galaxies you know precisely at the um, level of precision that we will have with uh, future galaxy surveys and another problem is that the simulations are still time consuming, even with, you know, machine learning and everything. Still, we cannot fully, you know, like brute force MCMC and do the full simulation based analysis of the um, boss data. Um, so this is still like a problem. And, uh, and an alternative to that is perturbation theory. So perturbation theory, basically writing down this, uh, you know, Taylor series, delta uh, nonlinear is delta linear plus delta linear squared and so on we know that it's well it's kind of fine it would work but it cannot work on all scales so at some scale it will break down and uh, so it only applies to limited region scales uh, but uh, on the scales where it works it basically can gives you it can give you a very high uh, precision and accuracy well formally like an arbitrary good precision accuracy and also it's very fast and cheap because basically you can do a calculation of all relevant observables like in a matter of seconds. Uh, and uh, it's a good thing because you can easily explore the extensions beyond Lambda CDM within this paradigm. So you can compute, let's say, the galaxy power spectrum for um, for some non-standard model that resolves the Hubble tension, like early dark energy, for instance. You can easily do it in perturbation theory. And also it's a very natural approach to marginalize over all this, uh, uh, you know, gastrophysics or all the galaxy formation um, uncertainties, just because really on large scales, all this galaxy formation physics is encapsulated by these nuisance parameters. We just marginalize over those and this will marginalize over all the astrophysics. So it has some 
advantages over the um, simulations, even though yeah, there has been a lot of success um, in terms of simulations recently. So I think that the two programs should kind of go together. Um, so sometimes I, 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 I'm asked, um, so why do I think that formulas work at all? Because, you know, galaxies are very messy and complicated and, and you know, people are striving to understand them really and have been striving uh, for many years. So let me just uh, give you an example of why warmly should work. Let's take a look at water. So we also know that water, if you look at the dynamics of individual water molecules, is also very complicated. You know, there are many uh, complicated, you know, um, forces that operate between at the molecular level. Uh, but we also know that if we focus on, on, on large scale dynamics of water, we can introduce some coarse grain fields, such as the density and, and, and um, the velocity field. And we can write down the continuity equation, the earlier equation for these fields. And in the earlier equation, we take, well, basically this form, and we know how to introduce, how to include different effects of small scale dynamics. You know, we can, we can write down pressure um, that depends on the, basically the, the sound speed. Then we can also write down um, the shear viscosity term that captures some molecular dynamic dynamics. And uh, this will come with some nuisance coefficients. So the, the sound speed and, and uh, the viscosity, shear viscosity are nuisance coefficients for this model. In principle, we can write down more uh, operators. We can introduce some higher order viscosity if we need and so on. Um, and uh, the good thing about this uh, approach is that this expansion, you know, in the right-hand side of, of the earlier equation is convergent because you can estimate the size of this higher order operator with respect to the just usual shear viscosity and it's going to be suppressed by the uh, mean free path over the uh, characteristic wave scale of, of, of um, fluctuations you're interested in. So let's say the, the wavelength of, of um, waves uh, in the uh, fluid. And so this is a small parameter that controls this expansion that kind of manifestly converges along with this is a small parameter. So this scale separation, you know, the fact that you have a small parameter, well, you have a distance scale, um, uh, which is the mean three path. And then there is a scale that you're also, that you're actually, you know, looking at uh, over here, lambda, and it's much greater than uh, mean three path. Basically scale separation allows you to describe uh, fluid uh, in terms of just, you know, few nuisance coefficients without ever worrying about these complicated uh, intermolecular forces. Um, so basically the same logic applies uh, here at the level of um, large-scale structure, uh, because large-scale structure also enjoy a scale separation. Um, so there are two relevant scales at the first kind of um, at first glance. So all this complicated galaxy formation physics, uh, it takes place on scales smaller than the size of the hell, which is few megaparsec. So this is the regime where we have to do a simulation, basically, and uh, like we cannot calculate this with pen and paper. But as we go to scales larger than the size of the halo, um, for instance, for galaxy service, we're interested in the correlation of galaxies at scales 100 megaparsec, which corresponds to the PO scale. Uh, so in this regime, actually, the galaxies can be well approximated as an effective fluid. And this fluid is going to be non-relativistic just because the relativistic effects become important much later when they hit the size of the uh, Hubble horizon, so a few gigaparsec. So this gives us, uh, you know, a significant range of scales where we can build this effective um, fluid description. And basically, the idea to describe galaxies as a fluid um, was introduced um, more than 10 years ago. It's called the effective field theory of large scale structure. And this has been a very uh, active field of research. And there were many people working in this field. Uh, here I just uh, um, mentioned a few of them, a few groups that significantly contributed to the development of the TFLSS. So I myself um, created an approach called time slice perturbation theory, which basically um, is the formulation of the TFLSS in terms of the uh, path, path integral that we normally use for quantum field theory calculation. And TSPT allows me to calculate uh, all this galaxy um, you know, clustering observables with basically 0.1% precision using Feynman diagrams. For instance, the lean order calculation I'm shown here, it, it um, can represent the sum of three loop or two loop diagrams in one country term. So once you put this all, all these things together, uh, you can see that you can actually, uh, you know, fit the galaxy power spectrum quite well. Um, so these calculations within uh, TSPT, I have put into code class PT, which is an extension of the usual um, Boltzmann code class. 
So if you know how to run class, it should be super easy for you to run class PT. And now we have within the EFT of LSS, we have a systematic program how to, you know, include next to in order corrections, two loop, uh, three loop corrections, and so on. Uh, and also, um, which correspond to something like, you know, you have one plus epsilon, one loop is epsilon, and then two loop is epsilon squared, three loop is epsilon cubed, and so on. And also, we know how to calculate the different endpoint functions, like not only the power spec, we can calculate the three point function, four point function. And so on. so now we have a we know what we are doing we know um we have a systematic way to calculate various things the only caveat is that this calculation always involves some kind of uses parameters which basically play a role of boosting coefficients in the eft and uh, those those uh, boosting coefficients always have to be fixed by the data itself so we have to fit them from the data and at some point you can imagine it would be a problem that you will have too many Wilson coefficients and like your data is not going to be good enough at constraining them. So I think that this is very significant actually a problem of this approach. Um, and you have to keep that in mind. So uh, I wish you that if it's correct. Um, so from the mathematical perspective, um, that's the only option basically. So we're quite sure, but also we have done several explicit checks. We have participated in a number of blind challenges. And basically, using the EFT, we're able to uh, recover the correct cosmological parameters from various simulated data sets. And the precision of those simulated data sets were much better than the uh, data that we have or that we will have in the future. For instance, here in the PG challenge, we had 0.1% uh, precision measurement of the galaxy power spectrum over here. So you cannot even see the error bars because they're very small. Also, uh, another in interesting test is the EFT at the field level. Because in principle, for all these Wilson coefficients, you can say, oh, look, you have so many free parameters. Of course, you can fit you know, the shape of the galaxy power spectrum. Um, but you have these three parameters that only control the amplitudes of, uh, of fields. You don't have any three parameters that control the phases. And you can actually calculate EFT at the level you know, of the full simulation. Let's say we start some initial conditions in our universe and do the full simulation. This one calculation, another calculation, we start, we take the same initial conditions and forward model them with the EFT and we compare the two. And this is uh, represented in this plot as a bias model. And you can see that the two match quite well. So of course the EFT cannot capture something like, you know, the interior of the halo. So where you have a lot of um, over density over here, EFT kind of fails. But for most of other things, EFT works quite well. And you see that the residual is very good except for the, let's say interiors of the halos. So this is another very non-trivial um, test that we have done. Now, uh, with all these tools ready, we have uh, applied them to the analysis of the BOS data. And with our pipeline, we have analyzed the uh, galaxy power spectrum and also the galaxy by spectrum. Here, I'm showing you some galaxy by spectrum data. And we're able to uh, measure the cosmological parameters of uh, of the minimal lambda CDA model. Well, for instance, here I'm showing you results for omega matter and H naught and sigma eight. And I guess there are two points that I can um, make here. First is that the, um, you know, our posteriors from both um, alone, they kind of sit on top of the Planck ones. So the Planck ones are obviously, you know, the best ones on the market um, for these parameters and uh, then the small, they have the smallest error bars. So we didn't find any significant tension, like we didn't find any five sigma tension. Uh, and the second important uh, point here is that the um, posteriors, you know, the precision with which we measure some of these parameters is actually comparable to that of Planck, for instance, for omega matter, it turns out that we're quite uh, competitive. So this was um, very interesting and surprising when I first applied this to the data. Um, so I, yeah, I got a question from, from George, maybe uh, I can, yes, I can ask. Uh, how are you checking baryonic feedback effects? Is it accurate enough to use K-square as an approximation? Yes, for the scales we're looking at, it is absolutely accurate enough to use K-square, right? Because uh, our scales, this K-square is suppressed basically, let's say by the size of the halo and we're still in the regime where this is a small correction. And then Adam is saying, does both include BBN? Yes, that's a very good question. Yes, here uh, we do include the BBN. So this results, they're fully independent from Planck, but we're using the BBN prior form um, for the uh, baryon density. Now, you can ask the question, what will you get if you instead try to feed the baryon density directly from both data? You can do that. And in this case, you are going to also measure each node that will, uh, it will be sitting here around you know, 66. The error bus will be bigger. Um, it will be still consistent with uh, Planck, but in that case, you will have no information from the BEO scale. 
And this is a very new method that um, Oliver Philcox was working on. I think originally it was uh, by Blake Shervin. So basically, if you were not to use the VBN and just feed the omega variants from, from Planck, you could extract H0 using a different source of information, which is also interesting. And I think that this, um, yeah, this result um, is also kind of uh, interesting because uh, it, it allows you to, it gives you a very non, new non-trivial um, test of lambda CDM. It's not from the equality scale, not from the ABBN scale, not from the BO scale, sorry. Right. Uh, very good. But these results, yeah, they, 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 they include the ABBN prior. Um, yes, it would be great to label priors used. Uh, sure. Th thank you, Adam. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, I will I'll make sure that this is done next time when I give this talk. Um, so basically, yeah, with these results, we uh, contribute a bit to, to the cosmological, um, to the general, you know, exploration of cosmological tensions. So here I'm showing you some plots from a, um, from a Snow Mars review that Eleonora was leading. Uh, and uh, some of these data points they correspond to our boss analysis. But let me maybe, for simplicity, like crop this um, to figures a little bit. So here I'm showing you results for the sigma tension. Yeah, let me crop these results and um, present them in this form. Um, well, this is something I I, I stole um, that I steal from Collins Hill uh, Twitter. So those are just few measurements, uh, direct and indirect measurements of each node. Um, yeah, as we know. So what 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 we're doing basically, you know, with posts and 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 the BO, well, and also the BBN. Well, here here all the labels are right, I guess, as Adam wanted. Um, so uh, we always assume some underlying cosmological model. Like for this method of measuring things, you always have to assume, okay, lambda CDM or let's say another model, early dark energy or something. And you get H0 within this particular model. So it is a model dependent uh, statement. So those are the measurements assuming lambda CDM from our data set and they seem, and also, you know, measurements from the CMB and they seem to all um, kind of agree and, and um, give you the H0 value around uh, 67. Um, and I think that this is the results. This is the results that I mentioned before. Those are the results for the um, basically boss EFT without the uh, sound horizon. So this is what you get if you don't use the BBM. Um, I think that this result was actually updated and, and it went a little bit this direction, but the error bars is, are going to be big. So it, it is kind of marginally consistent with both. Um, and then uh, of course, yeah, these results are kind of um, in tension with the um, direct probes, or um, sometimes also they're called um, the late time, late time measurements. So you can see, well, this is basically the uh, essence of the Hubble tension. And I think that, okay, those are some old results from 2020. Since then, the tension has become even stronger. Um, now, in terms of the SA tension, the situation is um, kind of interesting because also uh, for, um, so it's true that we still have to assume some model to extract the growth parameter um, as eight, but this parameter is much more model independent because it's kind of similar to what we actually measure, the amplitude of the galaxy power spectrum at a certain scale. Um, and this is in some sense is directly probed by, it's directly probed in a galaxy survey by this power spectrum measurements. And you see that these results are intention with, so here I'm showing you a bunch of the uh, results a bunch of the measurements from the galaxy surveys. Uh, so BOS, EBOS, different samples, quasars, uh, emission like galaxies, also different approaches, simulation base, uh, and another um, EFT realization. And also, um, you know, the use of correlation function and some extra data sets. <clears throat> so I, then on top of that, there are other, let's say direct measurements of the growth of structure that come from the weak lensing and, and different cross correlation of um, you know, Planck, uh, um, Planck symbol lensing maps with the uh, galaxy survey maps. And you see that all these measurements kind of um, give you the S8 value lower than 0.83, uh, which is the uh, prediction of the Planck um, lambda CDM model. So, and you can see this Planck symbol results over here. And this is the essence of the uh, S8 tension, which is not very significant at the moment. Um, but also receives a lot of attention. Here, maybe I, let me say that um, as we kept adding more data in our boss analysis, uh, the tension, I mean, originally it was kind of uh, maybe two sigma or so, but as we keep adding more data, it keeps 
you know, uh, it gets smaller and smaller. And I think that now it's already like within one sigma. So I would say maybe at this point, um, at least in terms of the galaxy surveys, we should say spectroscopic galaxy surveys, we should say, we should not use the word attention, we should use the word uh, agreement. Um, but um, yeah, this is just part of the general, you know, a picture where it seems that the galaxy surveys are, you know, giving you less, they see less structure than, than the CMB predicts. And we all, um, I guess, the broader cosmological community believes that tensions may indicate incompleteness of the lambda CD model. And here, let me also mention that the actor results, recent actor results are consistent with Planck, so I didn't put them on this plot yet. So I've got another uh, question from Adam. Uh, it would be great to update this coil and hill plot uh, for the last few years. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Yeah, it would be. Um, okay, um, good. So now um, let me um, discuss something which is a little bit uh, provocative um, about the RSD analysis and the EFT analysis altogether, you know, with spectroscopic uh, galaxy surveys. So they, there has been um, some claims in the literature, and there has been many measurements of, uh, you know, the growth of structure, the parameter F sigma 8 from spectroscopic galaxy surveys using different techniques. Um, and uh, they gave uh, results which are kind of consistent, but very much scattered. And um, I guess one problem here, okay, some people use this plot to basically say that, look, the RSD measurements are unreliable just because the scatter is so huge. So it's some kind of, you know, this 5% error bars are kind of junk just because the different scatter between different measurements is, is much bigger than that. Uh, let me just say that um, this, uh, you know, this different um, analysis, they do not agree, like they disagree not for a good reason, they disagree by bad reasons only because the methodologies and, and assumptions used in this analysis are uh, quite different. And let me say a few important things about that. Uh, so first of all, the standard, the, most of the analysis, including the standard one by BOSS and the BOSS, they use some approximate fitting models to extract F sigma 8. And those approximate fitting models, uh, they're not under robust theoretical control. And, uh, you know, in simulations, you can try to fit simulations and you see that very often these models fail because they are missing some important physical effects. And I think that for some of those models, it was actually shown that they work only because of some accidental cancellations that take place in lambda CDM. So you cannot you cannot ever use them to explore beyond lambda CDM models. Um, so I think that EFT provides you a very nice tool to um, like remove this ambiguity because EFT uh, is fully under theoretical control. Another important point is that um, this analysis they use different assumptions about cosmology. And for instance, the standard boss analysis, they fix most of cosmological parameters to the best fit values of Planck. Uh, and um, I mean, you can do that, but this will kind of artificially uh, destroy some important correlations that exist between F sigma 8 and cosmological parameters. So basically, for F sigma 8 is correlated with, let's say, um, Omega matter and omega matter is fixed to Planck, and you remove this correlation that that is important, and you you are using implicitly some Planck underlying Planck assumptions, um, and I think that yeah, different groups, you know, different measurements they um, go from using Planck for everything except for F sigma eight to using nothing. So basically, I think that our approach is to let's use nothing from Planck. Okay, we're going to use BBN, but nothing from Planck itself. Uh, like let's be the most agnostic about cosmology. I think that this is our kind of main point. And then another um, uh, point that I'd like to stress is about the priors because there has been uh, some confusion, I think, in the literature about the importance of priors and the so-called prior volume effects. So the um, essence of the statement is the following, that there is some sm small one second difference between the two EFT analyses, the our EFT analysis and the one by uh, D'Amico and collaborators. And the point is that, so we make different assumptions about the priors and the group of D'Amico uh, are using uh, quite aggressive uh, priors on EFT parameters. So for some effects like the stochastic terms, their priors are like orders of magnitude more narrower than, like more narrow than what we use. And this aggressive priors, they actually bias cosmological inference as well. For instance, if you use aggressive priors on the stochastic parameters, they're going to bias the extraction of sigma eight for for even like as uh, as much as five percent, and um, so the statement is that um, you know the two analysts don't disagree because of the prior volume effects. They disagree because of misspecification of priors. Uh, and another important point here is to make 
that I want to make is that also the posterior distribution for F sigma eight, or let's say for sigma eight in the CT analysis is, is uh, often non-Gaussian. And that's why you have to take into account this non-Gaussianity and you know, keep in mind that sometimes when you compute the 1D marginalized posterior, it doesn't reflect the full shape of the distribution. I think that um, that's also an important point. So um, anyway, I think that um, conceptually, it makes sense to me to use the most conservative prior, uh, basically, or let's say to remove priors altogether. And in this case, you're going to obtain, uh, well, this is basically the, the idea of our Sorry, this is basically the idea of our analysis. And also like a similar similar choice was made by the group of um, Martin White paper led by Stephen Chen. And basically our results, they agree perfectly. So if you say, okay, I don't know uh, nothing. Well, I don't know anything about the Gaussian formation physics. Let me be very conservative. Uh, and also you can say, look, I also, I don't want to use any Planck information. So in this case, you're going to obtain um, basically the results. Uh, that are shown here. Now, if you are going to go more aggressive in terms of galaxy formation physics or more, or you want to use more uh, information from Planck, then your result is going to shift, I guess, by uh, one or two sigma in this in, in this plot. Um, all right. So another point that I'd like to stress is that when we discuss, you know, this um, tensions, sigma eight, S eight, actually the scale dependence, the scale dependence is important because uh, these different measurements, of course, you know, uh, they they give you, let's say, a handful of parameters in the end, like S eight or F sigma eight, but they, they measure those parameters from different scales. And for instance, in, in the, you can ask the question, what are the scales that are driving this, um, S8 tension in the context of the spectroscopic galaxy surveys. Uh, and you're going to see that actually most of the scales, so here I'm showing you like the difference between, let's say the Planck best fit and the actual best fit of of, um, of BOST and, and marginalized over all you know, um, galaxy formation physics. And you see that most of the um, difference, so most of the tension is actually accumulated um, on for wave numbers less than 0.1 H or megaparsec. So here I'm showing you something that is similar to the cumulative signal to noise. And you can see that the um, basically three quarters or 75% of the um, this um, you know, sigma eight uh, disagreement comes from large scales. And at this point, let me just stress that it's kind of unusual. Like when you take a look at the skin dependence, it's kind of unusual. Uh, because for some physical effects, for instance, the massive neutrinos or some, um, you know, non-standard dark matter pro properties, you'd expect to change the cluster you know, on small scales, uh, right? So for massive neutrinos, this is the canonical, I guess, reference, uh, or canonical picture. So you see the suppression um, for K, which is greater than, well, let's say, well, for small neutrino masses, let's say greater than 0.1, whereas here, most of the effect is accumulated on scales above that, like around 0.5. So this would be here, like this scale would be here. So in other words, it's kind of um, non-standard and maybe in some sense um, gives room for doubts whether this effect is, is physical or not produced by systematics. But also you get some effect over here. So like, okay, there is some, you know, one quarter of extension comes from um, kind of uh, quasi-linear scales, okay, and this is something we can use for model building. So I get another question. Uh, okay, this is something. All right, good. Um, I get some some script. Okay, I'm going to answer this question later. Um, thank you. Um, right. So let me just say a few words now. Okay, well, the results that I presented um, that I just presented they were all about you know lambda CTM, but as I mentioned, in principle we can explore some non-standard scenarios. With, uh, with this BOSS full shape analysis. And we have applied this to a number of models. So basically this way we take advantage of this flexibility of the IFT team. So we explore things like the early dark energy, dynamical dark energy, curvature, dark matter, dark radiation, dark sector, and other things. Well, we worked a lot also on the inflation. So it turns out that we can really learn a lot of inflationary physics with the um, BOSS galaxy surveys. And this program was led by Giovanni Gabbas. So uh, maybe, um, you might invite him, you might think of inviting him next time for one of your seminars to discuss these results. Um, so in the reminder of my talk, let me discuss um, 
some dark matter modifications that are relevant in the context of this S8 tension. Um, so, okay, there is still some, um, yeah, we discussed all these caveats and, you know, possible systematics, uh, but still there is some kind of small disagreement in terms of, you know, sigma-8 and S8 measurements from both galaxy surveys and also from the weak cleansing results. Let's try to see if we can um, do some interesting model building in, in, in relationship with this tension. And I'm going to now present um, two works done in collaboration with uh, Oki Rogers, Alex Lagio, and others, and also with Adam Hare um, from UC. So in the context of dark matter, uh, so currently our paradigm is that everything is just called dark matter, uh, but we have uh, many, uh, well, we have some evidence that this might not be actually the last word. For instance, there are all the small scale problems. Well, for instance, well, you remember they were discussing things like, you know, too big to fail at some point. Of course, it's all uh, very sensitive to baryonic physics. Okay, I'm not going to go into this direction. Just use this as a motivation to explore beyond CDM models. Another question, which I think is very interesting, it doesn't um, attract that much attention, is the um, uh, some numerology, some kind of coincidence problem that the density of dark matter is only five times bigger than the density of baryons. So it's not 10 to the five, it's not 10 to the minus five. In principle, you know, most models this can be anything, but it turns out to be an order one number, which for me kind of suggests that the two sectors might be related. Um, and um, I think that also the S8 tension, so basically this several pieces of evidence, they suggest that maybe dark matter is not cold, or at least this fraction is not, is not cold. And turns out that large scale structure is very sensitive to this scenario, so it's actually, it's actually even more sensitive than the CMB. And uh, one example is axions. So we know that the so in the case of an axion of an axion with some small mass, we can effectively uh, write down this equation of motion as a fluid equation with uh, something like a quantum pressure, and this quantum pressure will prevent um, the formation of smaller structures. And uh, if we assume that um, you know only part of only part of uh, dark matter is axions, then it will not suppress structures completely. It will suppress structures only. Partly, uh, same way as neutrinos suppress structure. For instance, if we assume that the density, the energy density of axions is only three percent of the energy density of dark matter, and the typical axion mass is ten to minus twenty-seven electron volts, then we're, we're, we will um, find something like a um, twenty percent suppression of the galaxy power spectrum on the scales where we have uh, five percent uh, precision. So this is just to say that we're very sensitive to this kind of scenarios already with the current data and the, in the analysis uh, led by key rogers basically we explored these models and we analyzed this um you know axion um dark matter models with a combination of boss and planck data um and here i'm showing you the results the the um, allowed limits for the you know axion density as a fraction of the dark matter density as a function of the uh, axion mass and I guess the first relevant observation here is if you combine Planck and Bose, then the results typically improve. And sometimes they improve by orders of magnitude in the range of scales, like let's say uh, range of masses 10 to minus 28 electron volts. You see really the um, you know, combination of Bose is crucial. Um, for some, so the second point I'd like to make here is that for some masses like 10 to, 10 to minus 25 electron volts, Actually, the CMB is not very sensitive to them at all, and you can use both to constrain them much better than the CMB. Um, so this is because the you, you, well, we're finally taking this advantage of um, you know uh, CMB analysis probing uh, totally different scales. So here I'm showing you the uh, you know the S8 kernel and also the scales probed by the CMB and LSS. And you see that uh, in the range, well, basically okay, the CMB stops here, but you have a lot of sensitivity for S8. So this is the S8 um, integral kernel. You have a lot of sensitivity for S8 um, beyond this, like when you have no CMB, still the bulk of your sensitivity to S8 um, Kind of happens to scale smaller than the ones probed by the CMB, and that's why this galaxy service and local lensing service are so important. So basically, taking advantage of this information, you can additionally constrain the models that cannot be constrained with the CMB at all. 
Um, and um, yeah, this is another quote from that paper that um, uh, particle physicists like, um, and basically here I'm showing you how, how much BOSS can help us uh, in um, you know um, covering this uncharted range of parameters that can be probed otherwise. All right, this is just one, one particular application. Uh, another application is the um, model of dark matters interacting with variants. This analysis is done uh, that was led by a grad student from USC, Adam He. Um, so the idea is uh, is um, somewhat sim somewhat similar. Uh, let's consider yeah, let's consider the situation where part of a fraction of dark matter interacts with variants, and those kind of interactions are motivated by direct and some extent indirect detection uh, measurements. And in this scenario, you have some extra pressure between dark matter and baryons that also suppresses the, the uh, growth of structure, that suppresses structure on small scales. And typically, we, we can suppress, you know, the galaxy power spectrum, well, let's say 10 or 20% on the scales that are propped by BOSS. And if we actually consider this model, uh, so if we assume, if we look at the model that um, assumes that 10% of dark matter is composed of uh, particles whose masses are around one MeV, and those particles interact, interact with baryons through a velocity independent interaction, then we're actually going to even um, detect these um, interactions. So we're going to detect some zero cross section thanks to suppression that allows you to um, resolve the SA tension between the galaxy clustering and also the SA data. So here we're using the SA data for um, to obtain like really uh, let's say significant, well, let's say two sigma, two sigma um, preference for um, non-zero interaction between various and dark matter. So I'm not claiming that we have detected this. I'm just claiming that this is an example how the SI tension can be resolved, one of the possibilities. Uh, and uh, well, definitely I think that this kind of suggests that this sort of models uh, should be explored further um with um, upcoming galaxy surveys and uh, you here i have a slide with some um details about the about this particular model and the calculation we're doing so basically we're using a phenomenological model um where we uh, introduce some momentum exchange between uh, dark matter and baryons uh in a way similar how the um Momentum transfer is described, the momentum transfer between the photons and variants is described in usual on the CDM. So basically we introduce the similar, uh, you know, function R. And we use some uh, phenomenological prescription for the bulk uh, velocity that allows us to um, basically remove uh, non-linearities or like effectively um, avoid dealing with non-linearities. And um, this way we can, um, probe different models uh, with different dependence of the cross section on, on the um, velocity and the relative velocity between dark matter and, and, and variants. So here by variants, I mean protons uh, using the cosmology jargon. I think that okay, everyone should be uh, familiar with that. Um, so for this particular model, we focus on, on the velocity independent cross sections. In that case, the suppression of the, of the linear uh, power spectrum basically happens during the radiation domination epoch. So everything happens here at very low, high redshifts. Um, so we suppress the linear matter power spectrum, and after that, it evolves, uh, you know, in the same way as it does uh, in lambda CDM. So this is like a, an example of the early type, you know, early type model to uh, account for the uh, sigma tension because there are also models that try to. Uh, you know, model the, the sigma tension as, you know, phenomenon that only appears at lower redshifts, that suppression appears at lower redshifts. So this is an alternative to this, um, you know, um, late time S8 resolution resolving models. And from the microscopic point of view, a theory that will do that would be um, a heavy dark photon mediator. Um, so basically something like, um, you know, heavy weak interaction because it's like heavy, um, Z boson or like heavy, uh, well, dark photon here in this context. So in this in, in this case, from the particle physics point of view, it's kind of very familiar situation. Um, all right. So uh, I guess uh, yeah. Another plot that I want to show is um, that this particular model um, was not um, 
well, this particular model is interesting because it's it's uh, it was not ruled out by by other measurements. It was not ruled out by um, you know the, the observation of Milky Way satellites or direct detections or the you know, cosmic rays because we're, here we assume that only 10% of dark matter interacts with variants. And for instance, for Milky Way satellites, you have to assume that all of dark matter interacts with variants. So now uh, let me just stress again that for these particular models where only a fraction of dark matter interacts with variants, for these particular models, uh, galaxy surveys uh, basically allow you to, you know, they're very sensitive to these models and allow you to derive constraints on them. Whereas other probes like the Milky Way satellites basically cannot um cannot give you much information on those models so i think it's interesting like particular parameter space where the full shape of galaxy power spectrum data is uh, crucial um let me just say that yeah i have presented all these results that we obtained by analyzing the boss survey but in principle we expect that lss results will improve uh, by factor 510 in the coming five ten years with the help of new surveys such as daisy euclid uh, very urban observatory and spherex so this is very exciting uh, field to work in and uh, hopefully we can say more about the cosmological tensions in the future and uh, let me summarize my talk now so i hope i have convinced you that uh, eft is a robust analytic tool to um, model large structure clustering um, also the application of eft to the both data allowed us to measure cosmological parameters at the level competitive with cmb well with some extra priors like the BBN, but still. Um, then also we obtain novel ways to test new physics. An example is this, you know, um, axion like fractional dark matter models uh, that basically open us a new window onto the uh, you know different particle physics models. And we expect huge improvements in the future from upcoming surveys such as Daisy and Euclid. And with this data, many order one questions on um, dark matter and not only will be answered. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Really very nice talk. Do we have any questions? Yeah. See, there is a question on the chat. OK. An alternative and more um, a mundane explanation of this attention is that this goes by burying feedback, which is not well understood theoretically. Um, I think that in the context, um, in the context of, yeah, okay, let me go maybe to this slide. Yeah, I think it's a very, yeah, it's, thank you, thank you, George. It's a very nice uh, um, point. It's a very yeah, important point because in the context of the weak lens and measurements, I think that the bioing feedback represents a very serious theoretical challenge. Um, so this could, yeah, I think that um, this could, well be true that uh you know when we account for varying feedback this you know measurements can move back and forth uh in the context of galaxy service though um i think that we still operate so the difference with respect to lensing is that we like lensing goes really to very small scales even like it's very hard to separate scales it's very hard to say okay this is the k max uh for for um lensing because you extract information from many scales at the same time. Whereas with galaxies, we can use this kind of sharp cuts in scales and we can um, efficiently separate, you know, baryonic feedback or like other astrophysical uncertainties. Well, for instance, in the context of, for us, yeah, as I mentioned, I think you, uh, George already mentioned that, um, you know, we use case square to describe baryons. Okay, why it's a good, why do you think it's a good, uh, it's a good um, approach? Well, first of all, because we can estimate how large is the effect, and it's really small, and the case square is small for us, and the linear scale is, is far beyond the uh, regime where we're doing our measurements. And also, maybe let me show you again this uh, plot that I showed before, that in our context, um, let's say the bulk of the sigma attention comes from scales, which I would say even linear, right? So the point of this plot is here for every single, like for both curves, we have fully marginalized over all the astrophysical uncertainties. And basically this is why this curve, like, like in this um, particular range, this curves basically uh, sit on top of each other because they're sensitive to, like you can undo some of the changes by tuning astrophysics, but not here because those are basically linear I, scales. I agree with that. And so, you know, that idea is, is you know, really falsifiable. And if you, find cross correlations or 
RST that disagree uh, with, with Plankton, this type of baryonic feedback explanation is ruled out. Right. Um, yeah, I've heard that somebody is looking actually at the um, at the weak lensing measurements um, you're doing better baryonic using better baryonic models and um, yeah, do you have any, well, I don't know, are there any, there are rumors that actually this helps you fix. Well, I don't know, George, maybe you have more insight into that. Oh, well, well, I think, I mean, you know, in, in the, 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 the best way to, you know, I mean, I think from the theory point of view, it's really difficult to um, you know, say reliably exactly what baryonic feedback effects do. Mm. I think there's just too much physics uncertainty, and the effects that we're looking for are not that big, you know, actually. So, okay. so, um, and so I think it's difficult from a theoretical point of view, but in the future, you know, KS said, Thermalet said, those types of, of constraints could, could pin, you know, pin baryonic feedback. Uh, you know, to the required accuracy. Um, so, anyway, so, for, for, so I think it's all to oh. play for, really. Right. Um, and from the theoretical point of view, do you think that the um, you know, current hydro simulations, they are uh, they're good enough for for the kind of measurements you mentioned? No. <laughs> no? <Okay>. But, <laughs> but it's the, the people doing the hydro simulations uh, would disagree with that, um, you know. But but I think the physics is is really uncertain, and um, you know, I mean, what's happening here is that to, to get significant effects, you know, that would affect the S8 tension, you need to move matter around and empty groups. Uh, you know, you've basically got got to empty groups of. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, sort of mass ten to the thirteen solar masses. You've got to empty them, um, and that you could detect with, uh, um, you know, through Sunyad Zeldovich effects. Mm -hmm. I see. Could I ask a question about yeah. the, the the priors? Because mm -hmm. yeah. I'm I'm now you know following your, if I've understood you correctly, you're saying that it's the Choices of priors that matter in the RSD analysis, not uh, volume effects. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But, For instance, but, you can. Uh... That, that disagrees. Well, at least I don't understand. You know, because you know, Damico and uh, Martin White and Co. have argued that it is priors. And I mean, the, the Damico case, they put, you know, a linear combination i mean you know all of these effects are small right you know so the, the yeah. they move things around by one sigma one and a half sigma and mm -hmm. so on and so on uh but in the simulations that damico did they did a uh you know a, they set a prior on a linear combination of parameters you know bias omega matter and uh and i think age so linear combination which removed biases in comparison with simulations and then with that prior, they move close to, to the Planck value. Uh, White yeah. and Al found something similar. And, I, and so I'm confused um, now um, you know, about what you're saying. I mean, certainly if you look at the literature, the, when people choose pin parameters, and they put constraints on parameters that are close to the Planck values, the F sigma eight moves close to the Planck F sigma eight. That's definitely what you see from the literature. Anyway, I wanted to to know what you felt about that. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to discuss this more. So Eleanor is suggesting us uh, that um, we should discuss this uh, over email. It was, sorry, it was, it was a bit beyond. Was it referring to the to the questions on the shot? No worries. Okay, you can go ahead. Ah, okay. 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 Sorry. Sure. Um, right. So um, you see, uh, the problem with this, okay, if you want to go into technical details, the problem with, with, with um, the analysis by Tamiko is that they're using very aggressive um, priors on the uh, RSD counter terms that are correlated with F sigma 8. And then in turn, this leads to, to you know, shifts 
of other parameters that with that they later but these shifts are like entirely come from from wrong like from two aggressive priors on 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 counter terms and then they fix but instead of widening the prior so using you know, more consistent priors instead they introduce more priors that constrain the shifts that are coming from basically biasing the other parameters if you just remove let's say let me do this if you just take the pipeline and remove priors on the RSD counter terms altogether all the parameters come back to normal and you don't need to bias anything and introduce more priors so they have to do like that many you know iterations of priors just because they started with some inconsistent choices of priors that, that, that was biasing their results. And if you apply their priors, if you take their priors at, at, at face value, the ones that they are, they're using before they like ad hoc fixes later and, uh, and, and run a sim like uh, analyze some simulation data, you're going to find very significant biases, like five, basically this five sigma shift entirely is just entirely, you know, bias that comes from this misspecification. And you can check this on simulations that this is precisely what is happening. Now, there is another, well, I guess, okay, this is one most important, like order one question. And then there is a small question that comes from the fact that, okay, imagine you do for boss, you don't want to use any priors. You know, like you want to use their conservative priors similar to the ones that we're using or the ones that Martin White uh, is using. So in that case, you're going to the distribution in the you know parameter space, let's say sigma eight and uh, some counter term, red space counter term, it will be not Gaussian, it will be like a triangle shape, right? And in this case, the best fit will be somewhat offset from the um, mean of the distribution. But this effect, I mean, this effect it just comes from the fact that your original distribution is non Gaussian, so it's kind of natural. So you don't need to fix it ad hoc by by prior. You see, because uh, also there was a like iteration of this prior problem. I think there was a paper by um, Vivian Polian and others. So it's true that, um, you know, this problem that best fit is shifted with respect to the mean. Okay, if you interpret this as a problem, you can avoid, you can reduce it by introducing the prior. But why would you do it given that distribution like naturally is non Gaussian? Of course, you can enforce Gaussianity by a prior. But I think that, you know, for this kind of analysis, you would want to be not dependent on priors like you know the right way to do the right way to go is to be is to extract information from the data not from the priors in general so to me it seems that you know there are many ad hoc if you if you are sloppy with the priors it can introduce many problems and then you know people discuss various ways how to fix those problems but if you're conservative the priors to begin with you will see no problems at all in all this analysis thank you Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would like to know how much is model dependent to this uh, EFT that analysis of POS? So the EFT, um, let's say the calculation itself is, well, Okay, strictly speaking, everything is, is, is model dependent. So even the calculations we're doing right now, so if you change, for instance, if you change the dark sector, you'd have to introduce new, um, let's say new terms in your EFT expression. Um, so in this sense, I would say that, it, yeah, it is model dependent, but for each model, you can calculate things and it's like clear how to calculate them. Um, now for many models, in fact, you know, for many models that people discuss in the context of cosmological tensions, for instance, like the early dark energy. In fact, um, for these particular models, you don't have any extra degrees of freedom. So you can apply the EFT the way as it is right now. In this sense, it is, in this particular sense, it is model independent. Like for many models, that if, if the main effect of your model is just to modify the shape of the galaxy power spectrum, then the, the other EFT, the rest of the EFT just goes easily. The problem only appears if you want to, if you have extra degrees of freedom, or if you have, let's say, modifications of gravity, and you will have to change, let's say, the nonlinear corrections that you are using. So in that case, you know, I would say for bulk of the models, it is model independent. For some of them, it is model dependent. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.